Well, good evening everybody. There's a storm outside. Well, a little bit of a storm. Uh, the, it's got, it's just got a bit windy really, that's the problem. And I've left one door of the polytunnel open. So I will have to go across with my trusty friend here and the big torch out into that dark windy night and close the door of the polytunnel. And hope the fairies don't get me. <laughs> As I always feel I'm intruding on land of others at night time. <laughs> What's that noise you've made, Jack? <laughs> Was that a snort? Are you doing a dragon impression? He says, yes, I'll be a big fierce dragon out there. So, Sammy Bear and um, Beauty have both eaten their fill. Jack has just had a new bowl of biscuits put out for him. Oh yes, he said they were very delicious too, Mum. And the stove is lit there, look. So it's quite comforting. However, without further ado, I've got a couple of things I have to say. First of all, the video I promised, um, which I actually made, but in three parts, and that was the video I was shooting up at the People's Market at Strand Hill today, Strand Hill up beside the Atlantic Ocean. Um, I don't know how to put the three parts together. And there's no dialogue with it either. So I'm not too sure what to do with that. I'll have to put that to one side. The other thing, which is most perplexing for me, it's actually been vexing and I'm upset about it. So I better just tell you, because there's no point in dragging things out. You know the problems I've had to get In Search of the Goddess Rising to the printing press and then off the printing press. Well, I thought to myself last week, I've done it. And I was so happy about that. But this evening I go and I pick up one of the books and I think, oh, I'm just going to sit down and reread all this now. And would you believe it? But on the first page of the opening chapter, on page five, just towards the end of the first paragraph, there's a typo mistake. A word has been doubled up. And I'm mortified. I am mortified because it means every book in the thousand book print run is going to have that typo mistake on the first page of the opening chapter. <sighs> All I can do is anyone who's unhappy with that, I will offer you a full refund. It is one mistake, but I feel as though my integrity has been brought into question, really, because I, even even with my blogs on the website, I, I proofread everything. But I think how this has happened is that because the text kept slipping and the manuscript was going backwards and forwards from here to the printers in Dublin and PDFing it backwards and forwards, that in the end, when I came to proofread the hard copy, I thought, well, the first few pages were always fine. There was never a problem with them. So, anyway, 
that's me, filled with mortification. All I can say is that I suppose on, on the positive side, because there's always a positive side, isn't there? Anyone who buys one of the first <laughs> first print run copies, that type of mistake will be there. That will set the book apart from all successive printings because I've already corrected it on the hard copy. So all successive printings, that mistake will not be there. So, if I do become a famous writer, <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Those books with that mistake, <laughs> along with this video of my mortification, <laughs> may be very interesting to collectors of all things built in a cottage. Oh, anyway, look at Okay, I'm going to move on quickly now because there's no point in carrying on with this. So, here's the beautiful... <clears throat> Now, Jack, you'll just have to move your beautiful head to one side because I don't want your beautiful doggy hair all over this now because this is for a little a little baby's going to be lying on this at some point. So just move back. <laughs> Jack, go away with you. Go away with you. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to show you. Okay, this is just a small segment of the blanket that I've been stitching together. So it's coming together. I mean... All I can say about my mother is that she was a very generous woman, okay? She must have knitted about half a million of these squares. By the time it's put together, I think it's going to wrap, never mind my daughter and the baby, it's going to wrap the entire house up. <laughs> anyway, it is rather gorgeous and lovely and soft as well. So, there's all those envelopes gosh I was feeling so pleased with myself anyway I'm not going to hanker on about that there's no point um, so I went down to the people's market today and um, I brought my brother Cormac down and now Cormac is a leather worker you know he makes the most exquisite thi the most exquisite things in leather but we were looking around the stalls and there was this particular stall, market stall, where I said to Cormac, oh, look at that gorgeous bag. It's all worked in leather. Oh, Cormac, isn't that beautiful? It's a pity now that it was, you know, that that um, that a bag like that couldn't be made in a kind of leather lookalike because I know a lot of people um, who would like me, like to have one of those bags, don't particularly want to go down the kind of leather route. Anyway, we were standing there and looking at this bag and I thought, oh, this is gorgeous. I must ask the price of it. So I looked at the label and the label said, this is recycled rubber. I couldn't believe it. I said to Cormac, this is recycled rubber. It looks like leather. Oh, yes, he said, um... I can get lots of that in London from my suppliers. I said, oh, Cormac, I'd love a bag made out of recycled rubber that looks like leather. I mean, how... How, um, um, you know... Uh, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm quite excited thinking about this bag. Um, considerate of the environment. Okay should we say. How considerate of the environment is that? That not only is it not made in leather, but it's made in recycled rubber and it looks like leather. So when our Cormac is setting up his workshop over here and um, I know he's made some incredible things because uh, he was making costumes for um, um, uh, the Royal Opera House in London. He's a very, very clever, clever craftsperson. And uh, so he's going to make me a bag. So I said to him then, 
Cormac, I'd love to have some symbology of the goddess on this bag. And um, uh, maybe some nice Celtic symbols as well. Oh, he said, that's no problem. That's no problem at all. He said, I can do all that. So he's going to be working on a few designs. So I'm hoping that in the coming, you know, two months or so, two, maybe three months, I'm hoping I know by the time Christy, Dean uh, and Dwayne come to visit. Now, you know, Christy um, and Dean are in Australia and uh, 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 Christy Nickel is her name. Now, Christy has her own YouTube channel and I love watching um, the videos that Christy puts up because I find uh, the sound of her voice is lovely. It's quite therapeutic. You know, voices can be very healing. And um, so invariably I'm not watching because I'm, 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 you know, doing things and, you know, maybe could be working or, or just writing or whatever. I'm listening to her voice and in the background you hear all the birds. Because where she's living, um, it's almost like she's in the middle of a rainforest in Australia. It's really beautiful. So anyway, Christy and her partner, Dean, um, are coming to visit Beltona Cottage in March, at the beginning of March, which is really exciting. And uh, they're coming at the same time as uh, another uh, um, I suppose, subscriber. Dwayne started as, as a subscriber, but we've become friends, you know, because I've, I've come to know Dwayne through emails and through, um, you know, beautiful comments he leaves on Facebook. And um, Dwayne also has a channel, Dwayne Custer. So he's on YouTube as well. And um, talks about very deep and meaningful things. And... and uh, Get you thinking about things, you know? Um, so I like to listen to Dwayne as well. However, of course, it's me getting the time to to to, to kind of listen and, and watch all the videos I want to, but I do try to tune, as, tune in as often as possible, and they come through in my feed. But anyway, so I'm hoping to have this wonderful recycled rubber bag that looks like leather, on my shoulders, <laughs> shoulder bag, for some time, I suppose, the beginning of March. And uh, if, it, if it turns out to be a nice bag, Christy, if you're watching this, I promise to design, I'm going to design a bag for you and uh, get my brother to make it for you. Now, um, so we'll see how this develops because uh, uh, Cormac um, Cormac is a very affable and um, creative younger brother. Very fond of Cormac. In fact, let me just show you over here on the photographs. Um, <laughs> this is this is my brother Cormac. See that wee fella there? Look. And he's looking up at me holding the rabbit. Look at that. That's Cormac there. That's my mum and dad. Look at my mother there. She'd had 11 children. Sure, so they just looked like a, a casual couple. And that's me holding the rabbit. <laughs> the story of me and that rabbit's on YouTube somewhere. And... Uh, there we go, look. Um, that's, that's Cormac again, look there. That lovely wee fella. And he's still a lovely person. Very fond of Cormac. There we go. So, <clears throat> yes. Uh, and this is, this is a little chap here, look. One of my grandsons, that's Henry. I know Henry sometimes watches the videos. And uh, anyway, so 
there we go. That's a... Except for that one tiny mistake. I mean, what I could do, I could go through every single book and tip back side the word. <laughs> but I think I'd be very upset by the end of it. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, down at the market today, look, this is the one thing that I treated myself to. It's a beautiful handmade mug. And the reason why I bought it is because it's got a big, wide, kind of flat bottom to it, which is ideal then for keeping drinks hot. You know, if you place it on top of the wood stove like this. Um, and of course, the colours are beautiful, aren't they? The colour's lovely. And this was made, made locally, made here in Ireland. There's a lot of very creative people here in Ireland. Um, and not all of them are Irish, you know, many of them come from um, countries all over the world, actually. Um, they're sort of drawn to the west coast of Ireland as well. I suppose it represents, you know, the west coast of Ireland represents one of the last little places of wilderness, if you like. And because Ireland is underpopulated, then that wilderness remains intact, you know, there's, um, it keeps the integrity, you know. Uh, and people are very laid back here in the west of Ireland as well. I suppose it's very much like the west of Scotland, that's similar. And parts of Wales as well. And parts of England, you know, down around Cornwall, places like that. Anyway, I've got the orange light flashing again. And I thought I'd recharge this. Yeah. Well, Jack, we'll have to grab that big torch now and head off out into the darkness of the night to go and get that door closed on the polytunnel. Otherwise, the wind will get in there and blow the whole thing away. Yeah. So, good night, everyone. And bless you all. And I do hope you'll forgive me for that one typo mistake. It is one mistake. So, signing off in mortification. Blessings, Colette.